Well, um, I did my um, DC project on the John Hancock oration of the Boston Massacre, and he he orated it on um, the 74th. 1774, on March 5th. Um, he was born in 1770, I mean 1737, in Massachusetts, where he was born, and he remained where his father died, and he was placed with his wealthy uncle. And um, his uncle was a merchant, and he owned a business. And when um, John Hancock got about like 13, he started working for his uncle, and that's where he got a lot of his. Um, money and how he got like a big role in the government and how he earned his political achievements and um, he is known for being the president of the Second Continental Congress and he played a role in the governor of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts twice in his lifetime and he was a big authority figure because he was well known by most of everyone because of his participation in the war. Well like not in the war, but he helped provide money for the war in some cases. And he tried to use his money to do everything he could for his country because he really tried to push the colonists and especially the people of Boston to try to rebel and be separatists and not like go towards Great Britain. And then, um, and then just a little background information, um, the Boston Massacre was on March 5th, 1770, and, it, and people said it was a pre-revolutionary accident, and colonists threw snowballs with rocks in it at the, at the British soldiers, and um, Preston was their like, leader, and he like, shot into the crowd, and the others followed as they like, saw their captain or leader doing it, and... Um, uh, they killed five men, and then I think it said seven were injured, and um, the colonists started accusing them as murderers, and this was all because of the town shed acts, and they were mad about that, and a lot of them <coughs> were drunk at the scene. And then at the trial, um, after shooting the five men, the governor of the uh, the governor of Boston um, promised a trial. And John Adams, the cousin of Samuel Adams, took defense of the soldiers in Preston, and Samuel Adams was a defendant from the colonies that had backed up the soldiers. And um, only two were found guilty, and they were branded. And, yeah. And the other eight were not. And then just, I found this, and it's like an article what they put in the newspapers, and it shows that the soldiers kind of look mad, or not mad, but like they're having fun killing the colonists, and it makes the colonists look innocent. And this was by Paul Revere, and they were repealing the Townshed Acts when they they were like they were mad because of the Townshed Acts. Um, Mark, I mean John Hancock exclaimed in his speech that the generations gener and generations that were to come should understand the Boston Massacre and see that. Um, they should learn from it instead of, like, be mad at the king. And Hancock strongly believes that there, it was the Redcoats' fault and that um, they should have all been accused of murder, even the two that weren't. And it was basically to, to convince and persuade the, re the residents of Boston that it was yet another incident that would lead to independence and then it calls for liberty because the British games that they were playing we're never really going to stop until they broke away from them. And he was kind of like Samuel Adams in this, in this because Samuel kind of wanted to break away from Great Britain towards, like, more than anyone else really did. And he kind of pushed people to do that, and so did John Hancock. And he ex exclaims in the sixth page that the men's lives that were lost are never going to be given back. And... Um, Parliament and the king are going to pay for that loss when they break, when um, Independence Day comes. Well, he doesn't say Independence Day, but um, and he also says it's going to that it sparks freedom and hope for the colonists that like that it's a big deal, even though it like that the Boston Massacre is just one of the many 
like incidents that happened with um, the king and parliament and that it can't be just shut away just and it was a part of their rebellion a big part and a lot of them blamed the king for those deaths especially the people who were close to the people that died and um, um, here's the main passage of the speech that I picked I said I'm on page six but I gladly quit the gloomy theme of death and leave you to improve the thought of that important day when our naked souls must stand before that being from whom nothing can be hid. I would not dwell too long upon the horrid effects which have already followed from quartering regular troops of this town. Let our misfortunes teach us prosperity to guard against such evils um, for the future. Standing armies are sometimes, I would not by no means say generally, much less universally, composed of persons who have re have rendered themselves unfit to live in civil society, who have no other motives of conduct than those which a with a desire the present gratification of their passions suggests, which no property in any country men who have given up their liberties and envy those who, uh, who enjoy liberty, who are equally different to glory of a George of, or Lewis, who for the addition of one penny a day to their wages, would desert from Christian cross and fight under the crescent of the Turkish sultan. And um, I see that as maybe he would like he was reaching out to the colonists, and that's where he was like most like how he was really honest with them, and how they could see that he really wanted to break away from Britain because nothing was ever going to get better with them. And then um, this is just kind of a visual of his speech and to like show what, what it may have looked like in that time. And then um, the vocabulary, uh, perpetual, something that is everlasting and continuous, prosperity, all future generations of people, treacherous, guilty of betraying someone or something, then Philistine, a person who is uncivilized or hostile, emulation, to try to act like a person of great success, pittance, a small amount of money, and famous to receive a bad reputation or censure a disapproval of something or someone. And then that's my work cited. Are you ready for questions? Uh, yes. All right. So in your excerpt, you specifically talked about his views on standing armies and also mentioned his comparison to the British regular troops um, as almost paid mercenaries, correct? Yeah. Um, how do you think this use of language would have affected people that were, were listening to his speech? I think I think it may, may have been like a small proportion of the people who were listening may have been like, may have not agreed with some of the stuff that he said. Like, um, composed of persons who have rendered themselves unfit to live in society, in civil society, because um, some of them were, were um, they liked living under the king's rule even though they were in the colonies. So I feel like some of them wouldn't really like that, a small proportion of them, but um, a lot of them I think would see this as they like a wake-up call kind of and they need to like see what's actually going on and they didn't really at that point they didn't care whether it was king or parliament and they just needed to break away. So the timeline of this, it's, it's the fourth anniversary of the Boston Massacre which you did a good job explaining was very high on propaganda. Um, John Hancock and Samuel Adams and others used their version of the events to their benefit, correct? Yes. This is also about uh, four months after the Boston Tea Party, is that correct? Uh, yes. So how could this anniversary speech benefit people that lived in Boston specifically at this time period? Well, it was kind of the heart of the rebellion, and um, like like you said, with the Boston Tea Party and with all of them being fed up with um, 
parliaments and the kings like tax laws that they had no say in and everything they um i think this may have been like another step in leading to the olive branch petition and the, i think that was a big a big deal in boston and since that was where um like a lot of the government people were well like not a lot of them but that's where uh a lot of like some of them were okay um we know that the the actual boston massacre events were were misreported right a yeah. lot of hyperbole and overstatements did you find any evidence of john hancock using that same type of hyperbole or, or exaggeration in this speech uh yeah on page one just um in the second paragraph down i'm pretty sure he was talking about how we had um, the colonists were innocent, and there's no reason for that kind of fight went within innocent people. Okay. How did the British view John Hancock? Um, they didn't like him very much, and they saw him as yet another rebel, as they did um, Sam, Samuel Adams. Okay. And they saw him as someone who maybe pushed the colonists to the place that they were in when they were um, signing the Declaration of Independence, well, not the colonists, but um, the Founding Fathers when they were signing the Declaration of Independence. Okay. Do we still use messages like this today? I mean, do we have events or celebrations, or excuse me, maybe not celebrations, but commemorations of events after they happen, and, and sometimes we get carried away with language like this? Uh, yeah. I think a lot of the things that people use now in, like, um, like go back to the to like um con like messages like these and they're and I think they're overused a lot and um just like in Jefferson's um in his letter that he wrote like um that that line I forget what it says but um it's overused a lot and it's used in like um situations that it probably shouldn't be used in okay like, and it's not viewed as seen as the way it was supposed to. So, what possessed John Hancock to give this oration? Other than it being the fourth anniversary, I mean, every single day could be an anniversary. What do you think John Hancock wanted out of his this speech? I mean, how long is it to give the audience a kind of an idea? How many pages long is this speech? Um, like eight. That's a lot of that's a lot of speaking, right? On like a really in well, it was eight pages on um, my excerpt, and it was a really small font, so I don't know how small it would be. Did you get any sense to how long it might take for him to 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 say this out loud to read this? Well, I imagined he like like any oration, it would be like kind of with emotion and like I don't like side talk here and there, mm -hmm. and maybe pausing. So I. I guess it would be about maybe 20 minutes, maybe longer. It's a long time, right? Yeah. Um, if I remember correctly, this is at a time where uh, <coughs> residents of Boston and greater Suffolk County are, pro are, are almost on house arrest, right? There's limited public meetings. Yeah. Uh, the British probably aren't really excited about them, only remembering this event from their particular point of view. Um, so there might have been a risk for John Hancock to deliver this oration. Um, but in the back of his mind, do you think there's something that he wanted as a definite consequence to this? Um, if you were there, what would he want you to, how would he want you to respond to this? Well, I think he wanted, um, well, besides the fact of um, getting liberty and independence, I think he wanted to, like, show the king that they were, that they could, um, survive on their own in that, um, and he, I think mostly he wanted the, like all the soldiers that were in that circumstance would like to be like highly punished, maybe prison or even death. Okay. Even you have anything else to add? Uh, nope. Okay. Thank you very much. You can hit the button.